everybody. My name is Lewis Stewart. I'm the Chief, of Inf Chief Innovation Officer for the City of Sacramento. Uh, three years ago, when I uh, joined the City of Sacramento, uh, we launched what is called the Sacramento Urban Technology Lab Framework on behalf of the city. The goal was to begin shaping the future of, of the tech conversation here in Sacramento so that we'd be better positioned in strategic sectors that could advance our workforce, promote economic growth, establish our city as a global policy influencer, as the capital of the fifth largest economy. You can find out more about the framework at innovatesac.org. But one of the seven sectors you'll see uh, there is cybersecurity and IoT. Why, you may ask? Well, because our world is becoming more and more uh, digital and more and more connected. The belief that cybersecurity and IoT will be vital uh, to most everything that is being developed or going to be developed. You know, it's been, it's actually really been tough uh, developing a, a cybersecurity um, community in, in our region. And, you know, but here we are today, probably cybersecurity is one of the most, th most important things ever. In fact, the, the FBI says that cybercrime reports have quadrupled during COVID-19. So we thought it was important to bring together some experts to discuss why it's important and the need to develop a workforce for the uh, workforce of the future now. With that, I'd like to introduce two of my favorite people, Carmen and MJ. And we're gonna have a little discussion with all of you about cybersecurity in the age of COVID. So let's just kick it off with, in your respective practices, you know, if you guys could talk about it a little bit, what have you guys seen as far as increasing reports and what kind of cyber crimes have you guys, and, and hacks have you guys been seeing in the industry? Let's start with Carmen. Thank you for having me, first of all, uh, Louis and the city of Sacramento. Um, yeah, so a couple of things that I've noticed just recently or last couple of months with the, with the COVID pandemic and all of us kind of throwing, uh, you know, our world upside down. A um, couple of things. First of all, I think the bad actors, they know that most of us are working remotely because that has been, you know, the, uh, the executive direction of you know most businesses shutdowns and working remotely so they know we work from home they know that a lot of us are not connected to the secure corporate network so there's a definitely open vulnerabilities that way um and also i think a lot of uh, bad actors are preying on just our fear our fear and we wanted to be informed as much as possible so all the information about the covid pandemics a lot of articles click here, click there. Um, so there is a lot of uh, ransomware and a lot of uh, just, you know, um, there's a lot of ways to get, get into our home network by just us clicking on links. So right. those are the couple of things that I've noticed. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. And right before we jumped on everybody, MJ was sharing a crazy stat with us that he's, he's heard that there's, that every day there are more than 2,000 COVID-19 related URLs uh, being created. Bless you, MJ. And you. uh, yeah, you're welcome. So, you know, if you can continue, you know, the, the thought that, that uh, Carmen just kind of left off. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, Carmen, Carmen's 100% correct. Um, and, and thanks as well, Lewis, for, for inviting me on. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to partake in this conversation. But yeah, you know, Carmen, Carmen's 100% correct. With everybody working from home, it is, you know, what, what you will often here referred to as a target rich environment. There's just, you know, home networks are not secured the same way that corporate networks are. And many companies pivoted without the time to deploy corporate resources into the homes with their staff. So you could very well have people out there working on compromised machines and depending how they're connecting back to the office, they may or may not be a uh, knowing or unknowing uh, or unknown threat to the, to the business. But you know the amount of activity, to your point, is is just astronomical. At one point, I heard a stat that there was something like a 613 percent increase in in malicious activity going on, and and I haven't had a, I, I haven't found the source for that to corroborate it. But based on many other um, indicators that I'm seeing, I I don't for a minute think that that's actually off. Um, you mentioned the, the crazy amount of domains registered. Um, I think it was Microsoft that just just recently took down a bunch of COVID-related mm. domains. Um, 
you know, to Carmen's point, we're, we're, we're voracious consumers of information now. And, and the thing that I think most people don't think about is how sophisticated these threats are. You know, someone once said to me, um, or actually this might be from, um, from a book called Gray Day by Eric O'Neill, who's a former um, FBI agent who took down Robert Hansen, if you're familiar with that story, who was a, a agent for the Russian government within the FBI. And I think it was in his book that he said, you know, are, are the image of the hacker being the, the teenage kid with skin problems pounding monster drinks in the parents' basement is not at all what it is. Right. That it's, it, these are typically nation state actors, even when it's organized crime, there are often former espionage uh, professionals who are who are advising or directing the activity. So you know the the threat is at a it, it's an existential threat that I think most people don't truly understand. And even even just over the last week, even today, um, with some some things that are coming from our government, you know, we're we're hearing very direct reports about Russian government activity, Chinese government activity. Um, those are just two. Um, right. There are others out there as well. And, and so these threats are multi-pronged and multifaceted, and they're designed in ways to, to trick us. And so, you know, a lot of the information going around about COVID is being generated by what we call trolls and bots and, and sure. you know, hacker gangs to get us <laughs> to click and propagate stories to get more people to, to click into things. And so the threat is very real and very dynamic. Yeah. yeah, Carmen, did you have something to add? No, that was basically, I was just going to say, you know, it's, we, we should never be comfortable, but now it's like the, the alert should be, uh, you know, even, even higher, we should be so much more alerted and so much more paying attention and, and learn how to actually, before we click on anything, look at, look at who's from and what's, you know, just to see <coughs> look it. And then a lot of times, you know, if something is, if they're asking you to do something, go talk to the person that you think the email is from and validate it, give them a call or something, right? I mean, just those little things I think we can all do um, to uh, prevent some of the, the serious uh, incidents. Yeah, and, and I just want to say to everybody watching, this, this, this webinar isn't really to, it's meant to scare you, right? Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is really meant <laughs> yeah. to, to inform you about what's happening and the realities of, of you know, what cybersecurity, cybercrime, cyber workforce development is, is like. Just to de demystify it a little bit, you know, based on maybe some of the stuff you are hearing on the news. You know, last week we heard about the Twitter hack, but we found out that that was kind of dual pronged. They convinced somebody inside <laughs> to, to give them access to accounts. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, just so, so everybody watching, just listen, listen and learn, right? Um, you know, people call me a little paranoid and crazy. Uh, and, and I guess to be a chief innovation officer, you have to be. But my, yeah. my, home, net, my home network, is segmented five ways. You know, I, I have um, I have you know VPN on all my all my devices. Uh, set up my my encryption on the firewall, and that's just from when I used to be an IT guy. And and so you know, trying to convince my kids to stay off TikTok now is 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 a is a, a new thing. And and you know, my daughter, to her credit, 17 years old, deleted it. Um, you know, I have to figure out if my my twenty one year old did. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if, yeah, but it's know, funny. But it's, even it's, ordering it's, anything from China, right? It's 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 yeah. you have to think twice. I mean, those are the things that we used to not think that much about, you know. But it's right, right. more and more. I mean, it's it's is those little things that steps that we take. I think is going to definitely uh, you know uh, keep keep us safer. Yeah, yeah no, but absolutely. It, it, and, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, no surprise, you're my kind of crazy. My network segmented the same way. <laughs> but, you know, what I think is important, and, and it's funny, I was just having this, this a very, very similar conversation earlier today. Network segmentation is something that most people don't understand. And it's one of the simplest things we can do to, to raise our security posture, not just in the office environment, but in home. And, yeah. and the conversation I was having earlier was that, you know, I, I, I very strongly believe that businesses need to be talking to their IT department or their outsourced IT partner about a, what I'm, what I sort of loosely termed a 
appropriately extending themselves into the employee's home. You know, for, for not a lot of money, you can get an appropriate firewall device to sit behind your broadband modem that will segment the network. And when we talk segmentation, just, just you know, think about, think about the HOV lane on, on, on a highway compared to the regular travel lanes. They're, they're segmented by big barriers usually. And if you're in the HOV lane, you can't get back into the regulars and vice versa. You know, that's a, that's a very simplified example of how a network could be segmented. So, you know, to your point, Lewis, at home, I'm on my own segment. I do right. my work on my own segment. I've got a segment for the kids, even though they don't <laughs> live here anymore. <laughs> I've got a segment for all my smart home devices because I have yep. way too many of them. And yep. I've got a guest network and, and, you know, never shall the two talk to one another or any of them talk to one another. And that, that's a way you can keep safe. And that's a simple thing we can do for people working from home that's not going to introduce a tremendous amount of cost or complexity for the company or the employee. So I think it's, right. I think it's so important that these conversations are, are, uh, you know, our kind of crazy needs to become normal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that is very true. And, and that's a sort of a perfect segue into the small business, yep. uh, you know, cyber risk management, right? I mean, it's yep. uh, uh, typically small businesses don't have the resources to hire an extensive security staff um, or, uh, you know, by, uh, um, by expensive technology, right? So, but there are things that they could do, like you're saying, segment the networks, right? That's, uh, I mean, you, those are the things that are definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the small business thing is, is huge. You know, I, I think there's, there's a, a large segment of our audience that is rep that re either represents small business or a small business. And, you know, at, at the baseline, you know, look at the bottom of your cable router and, and change that password. But then when you actually log into the router, usually the, the default password is password. It's password. Uh, <laughs> so so at, least, yep. at least get knowledgeable enough to, to get in and, and at least change your admin password to the router so that, yeah. you know, bad actors on the street can't just log in and do some damage to your, to your network. But can you guys kind of elaborate a little bit around small business perspective and why it's critical to look at, at cybersecurity, kind of expand on what Carmen was saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the most important message there is that it, it, it's, not, it's not out of reach. It's not so complex or so costly that it's on, only the realm of the Fortune 500. You know, like, like all things in the technology arena, cost and complexity come down kind of exponentially from the early days. And so while, you know, while at one point it was only the, you know, General Motors and, and you know, Fortune, whatever, pick your number that, that could right. afford to do this, every business can afford to. The question is, is understanding what your risk profile is and designing a program that's sensible. And it's not only exactly. technology. I mean, right. education is a massive piece of this. Huge. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it can't, I, I, I would say that the education piece, the risk is massive. The education opportunity is massive plus. Um, right. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, it, bad analogy, but, but it came up in the, in the conversation earlier today. If you buy an alarm system and you leave your windows unlocked, well, shame on you, right? You know, somebody forgot yeah. to educate you what your responsibility is. The alarm system's there, it's working great, but you did something that facilitated working around it. Well, that can happen every minute of every day right. in, in, in an IT environment. And so, right. you know, we get frustrated with end users, you know, the, the, the people on the front lines doing their jobs using computers, but we need to kind of reflect back as executive teams and as technology professionals and say, isn't it really our fault for not training them? We train them on doing their job or they came with appropriate experience that we then tune to our business. We need to do the same with when it comes to cybersecurity. See, a lot of, um, I think a lot of larger companies have the HR handbooks and they, they have that as part of it, right? Um, to have that cybersecurity awareness uh, class, you have to take it. It's part of the, you know, your performance plan or whatever. 
Um, but the smaller companies may not have those kind of policies or handbooks. But even if you only have two, three people, it's worth it invest uh, into some, some sort of online course. There's plenty of those out there. And then, uh, you know, keep your small team, you know, aware of security risks. I mean, it's just super important because think about it, just how expensive it can be if the data is breached. Even if they have a small database of, of customers, if it's breached and, you know, the, the cost is tremendous. A, yep. co a company will not survive it. Special small business will not survive that if the data is breached, right? So, Absolutely. yeah, that's, uh, it's super important to, to do some investment in education in cybersecurity awareness and put some, um, you yeah, know, technology that's affordable out there. There is some that's good, that's affordable, that you can have to set it up correctly too, you know, right. have, have a right. little bit of help to have it configured right. Yep. And I think you have to change the culture around it too, from being kind of a, a punitive or, or negatively reinforced culture. I think you have to you have to let your people know that it's okay not to know and will help you right. learn. And yes. it's far more important that the individuals come forward and say, I think I may have an issue here yeah, yeah. than to bury it. You know, one of my clients emailed me this morning, it, it, which I was thrilled about you know, they're implementing a new phone system and they got an email from the company um, that's doing it and they forwarded it and said, I just want to make sure this is okay because yeah. it's the first email I'm getting. I know this is the company. I know we're making this transition, but it's got my pin number and a temporary pin and it's asking me to click and change. I was thrilled. I mean, yeah. this was as legitimate a message as could be. And they you know, to use common vernacular, they fact checked it a little bit themselves. They hovered over yeah. the links. They saw that they weren't different domains, but they still reached out and checked. And yeah. to, you know, to, to the point Carmen made earlier, that's so important. You have to check, you know, you, you don't want to be the one that spread the fake story. Um, right, right. Click the wrong link. Right. So we got a, we got a question from from Aziza, uh, head of the the Sacramento Black Chamber, and she she is asking us to dive in a little bit, a bit deeper on the affordability for small businesses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, both of you have said that that you know it can be affordable. Can you guys expand a little bit on on how it's affordable for small business? Carmen, I'll yeah, um, sure. Um, actually, that's one of the things that our focus, our consulting part of, of our business is doing the cyber risk management. And so, so we, we, our model framework is based on, um, you know, the, your revenue and the size of your company. So to make it affordable, that's one of the things why we even started this business is because we saw that everything was pretty much out there for, for larger companies, large, larger corporation, but nobody was thinking about business, right? So, so um, yeah, we do, we are that focus. So, um, we don't do any technical implementation. So, because we want to be independent, non-biased, right? Provide your, your cyber risk um, uh, assessment. Here's your plan. Here are your weaknesses. Here's what you, you need to improve. And then either, if you want our recommendation, we'll give you a recommendation. We have a lot of partners that do the, the, the technical implementations. Uh, but in, in I mean, there is a way to keep it low, uh, but there are a lot of um, companies that actually focus on small businesses, right? Because it's not, maybe not as profitable for them, but we do that. Um, I don't know specifically, MJ, about your business and what exactly you're doing. So maybe you have some insight there. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm similar. I don't, I don't sell or implement anything anymore. I've, I've, I've uh, been there, done that. Um, but I do, I do work with companies that do. I'm also involved in several cyber initiatives across different elements of the industry. And, you know, for me, when I say it's affordable, um, there, there are a few things that, that come to mind. And, and, you know, simply put, you know, what, one, one super simple example is, you know, for, for you know, less than $500, you can get a capable device that you can put into an employee's home that will segment the network and be able to be managed by your IT team or your IT partner. There's, you know, these were devices that even just a few years ago were thousands of dollars. And, and, right. and so, you know, if, if you've got 10 employees and you have to spend a thousand each, that's $10,000. If you only have to spend 500, that's $5,000. 
compared to the cost of the risk or a potential breach, that's, that's, that is affordable. Now, I recognize for some businesses that still may seem a little bit difficult, but the key is to find the right partner that will work with you. And, you know, yeah. I work with companies that service small businesses, and I, I help them devise what I call realistic cybersecurity approaches that are based on the business, based on the risk, based on the budget. But even now, I've seen, and in, in, in increasingly so, and, and I think this will only accelerate, you can save a substantial amount of money on your cyber insurance if mm -hmm. you invest oh, yeah. in appropriate cybersecurity tools. If you go through a risk management audit like Carmen was talking about, you can oftentimes save yourself quite a bit of money in, in insurance because what insurance companies are doing is they're recognizing the actuarial risk here, how they play their mm -hmm. numbers game. And if you invest a little money in making yourself more secure, they will reduce your premium in meaningful ways. If you don't, they will raise your premium in painful ways. And yeah. so oftentimes you, you could quite literally be faced with, do you want to spend several thousand dollars for your insurance? Or do you want to spend that several thousand dollars once and save it annually on your insurance? So there are many different ways that it can be affordable. The training is certainly very affordable in many different yeah. ways. And there are things happening in the industry um, that are helping to help small businesses. I'm, I'm involved with an initiative, as Lewis knows, um, creating an organization called an ISAL, which is something that, that was a government mandate to help raise cybersecurity resilience and, and positive activity in the marketplace. And, and I'm working with a nonprofit association with this, uh, with this initiative to help companies that specifically service small businesses better understand and be positioned against the risks, therefore they can better assist their customers. So there are lots of things happening in many different ways. Even just, you know, participating in conversations like this help because we need to talk about this across the, the, the mainstream of our, of our small and mid-sized business community because you're not, everyone faces the risk. There's not a single business out there that exactly. doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so two quick things. Can you can you briefly explain explain an ISAL for our viewers, mm -hmm. and and briefly give a definition of cyber resilience for for our viewers? Sure. So, so an ISAL is a mouthful. It's an information sharing and analysis organization. And to to whittle that down to plain English, um, there were there were a couple of presidential directives in the late '90s into the into the 20 teens that really talked about better sharing of cyber threat information within different communities. So originally it started around an acronym called an ISAC, which instead of an organization, it was a center. And those were focused on critical infrastructure. So think nuclear power, natural gas, electricity, to help defend those critical pieces of infrastructure against cyber threats, which as we're learning in the news every day, there are, there are active cyber wars taking place. It's just, thank God, no blood has been spilled yet. Right. Um, but what this ISAO is doing is basically, and, and, and the term, what the term cyber resilience means is, we're basically bringing critical, highly technical, complex information to the mainstream. So as an example, you're a local law firm with three partners and you've got one office and you work with an IT company that supports your network because you're not large enough to, to have an IT person. Well, that company is going to belong to this ISAO and this ISAO is gonna say to that company, hey, Mr. IT company or Ms. IT company, we know that you use the following technologies and support them with your customers we're aware of a risk and where this risk information comes from is a collaboration of both government and private industry. So Homeland Security, FBI, Secret Service, you know, cybersecurity companies like Palo Alto and Cisco and Sophos and others, they all generate threat information. These organizations consolidate it and make it understandable. So the organization says to your IT company, hey, there is a threat 
in the Meraki firewall that you deploy to your customers. And this is what the threat is. And this is how a hacker could exploit it. And this is how you need to secure your network and how you need to secure your customers' networks. So then that law firm without even knowing has the comfort and peace of mind that their IT partner is aware of these risks and addresses them before any harm can come to them, before somebody steals IP on some startup that they're working right. with who's going to create the next whatever. Um, it's, it's that it, it's bringing it down to a level that everyone can understand and act on because the one thing that happens in the world of technologies is my God, we produce acronyms more than I don't even know what. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> we love yeah. it because it's a simple yeah. way to talk, but we make it's our, faster. you know, we make our family members and our and everyone else we deal with insane. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's real, you know, when 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 I think of cyber resilience, it's about, you know, for lack of a better word, it's about simplifying it to the point where it actually does good. Because in many respects, it's so complex that it's hard to do good with it. And we need to simplify that significantly. No differently than, you know, when the computer first came on the, you know, came around, they were pretty complex. I remember my dad in the, must have been the early 80s. He had a, he had a clean, a, a quote unquote, clean room that was probably the size of my home office that had special air conditioning and this massive cabinet that had, I think, an eight megabyte, you oh, know, wow giant tape wheel in there. Sure. And, and, and that was how they ran their business, right? Yeah. Now you can go to Best Buy and, and, and run circles around that for you know, a few hundred dollars. Right. So you know, we, need, we need to take that complexity and cost and, and apply that same model to what we're doing with cybersecurity because guess what? The, the hackers, they know that not many are doing a good job at it. And that's how they're getting away with what they're getting away with. And we need to, right. we need to turn the table and go on the offense. And that's really, it should be information sharing and analysis offense or something. I don't know. Uh, but it's You're absolutely right. And, and think about it. I mean, you know, uh, talking about the business resilience or just making, making your business resilient, um, you know, make it a business problem. But for the longest time, it was an IT problem. It's, it's been a long ago when that was a problem. It's been a business problem for a long time. We just need to keep bringing it to attention, keep bringing it to the business level. And that's, that's exactly what you said. I mean, we ha if we put it in business terms, it's much easier for yeah. business than to consider being a part of a, a daily uh, operations, right? It, right? Security has to be in everything we do. It's not an IT, IT thing, it's not an IT expense it should be part of operational budget. I always say that it's it's you when you put your budget together, you put it in your operational budgets, not so much oh IT equipment and you know other type of purchasing. It's it really is this is you're running the business. Um, yep. It has to be there. It has to be that level. So true. Yeah. Yeah. You said you said something very important. It it is a, a business problem. It is something that needs to get invested in. And and even for the cyber insurance stuff, it's getting more and more important for the CEO to be versed in cybersecurity. Uh, not just the IT team anymore, right? So so as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it should be forefront in your mind as you're developing out your business, how to protect your infrastructure, how to protect your business from from you know from anything. So Yes, there's, there's great consultants out there that, that do fantastic work and, and IT partners out there. But you as a CEO, you as the entrepreneur, need to be thinking about, you know, how do you add a security layer to, to everything that you do from your website, especially if you're an e-commerce site, uh, to, to just interactions on your computer uh, that, that's running your business operations. Um, it's, it's, it's that, you know, it's, it's that important uh, for, for people to understand. And so kind of just rewinding a little bit, yeah, I have you guys both here and, and I appreciate you guys being a part of this. I want to kind of go into to how you both come into the place of cybersecurity. You know, what brought you guys here? You know, how, how did you get passionate about this? What led you to this space? And let's start with MJ. Um, well, for me, it was, you know, running running what was what's called an MSP, a managed service provider, and and providing technical services to our clients. We We had one client in particular that was a somewhat of a unique, um, unique client. They they audit. They did a form of hospital auditing from a medical perspective. I'll spare you the 
gory details on that, but because of, uh, because of the nature of what they did, everything they touched was PHI, protected health information. So they were, gotcha. they were very security conscious and they, they, were an early, they were an early entry into that space. And so they pulled us in with them. And as I started to see what some of the implications were of what they were doing and the type of data they were handling and the risks to businesses um, that were involved in this work, as well as the individuals, and protecting, you know, very sensitive information about individuals, you know, it just became clear to me that that we were not, we were not, as business people, as a global business community, are not not aware of the risks that were facing us. Sure. And and, you know, I wasn't prescient by any means. I wish I was, but you know, I didn't foresee the future. But it certainly has played out. And so it, it just, you know, that really sparked my passion. I had a, I've, I've had a passion my whole life for um, studying the conflict between the Western world and, and the former Eastern Bloc or, or Soviet Bloc. I, mm -hmm. I studied that and I, I became fascinated by the, by the dynamic and I, I see a real corollary there. And right. so it, it spoke to something that, that I had an innate curiosity and passion for, and it, and it really sparked a renewed passion in me for the industry. And, and so, you know, the, the, the deeper I get into this, it very much to me felt like it has become my life's work to try and help in this area and to try and help educate. So I'm very, very fortunate that I, I get to work in something that I have a very strong personal and professional passion for. And I feel like people like us need to help educate people right. because we need to address this as a collective global community. This threatens the global economy, right. not, not to be cliche, but it, 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 it threatens every business, every country, no differently than COVID-19 threatens every individual. Right. Yeah. Carmen? Yeah, so I am probably one of the dinosaurs in information security. I've, I've started in the 90s, and especially being a woman in information security at that time was a very unusual because I think I was one, or actually I was the, same beside the VP, um, the only woman on a team of 200 uh, information security wow. engineers at the Stanford Research at that time. But how I got into it, I was actually technical support for the Stanford Research. I was in a, um, on a team of five, and a lot of these security guys would come and just get their, their computers re-imaged, re or you know, they just had work done, or get, get them fixed, and so on. And so I would chat with them. And right. we were talking back and forth, and they would tell me what projects they're working on. They were you know, uh, doing the penetration testing for the Singapore Airlines, so they did this and that, and it was just like, wow, that sounds really cool. You know, I want to learn more. I felt like I, I want to know more. And so the position um, I became open on the team, uh, information security team, and I applied and, and got in. And it was just one of the best experiences. I had so many mentors. Um, I've learned so much. I mean, daily, there, there were new things uh, from, from the tools, from just the techniques, and from, you know, there's, there's so much that I've learned. So I, you know, that's another thing that mentorship is so super important. Mm -hmm about the workforce development later on and mentorship and those kind of things. But, um, but I think for me, the best part of being in information security was it was a con continuously uh, uh, the research. I mean, I would, I would be learning every single day. I had to stay on top of everything. So daily doing the research of vulnerabilities, you know, and then ap applying the patches. Um, talk about uh, the new threats, you know, it, it was just such an active, active role. Mm. And it's never boring. It's never right. boring. Um, so um, I think that was one of the things because I, I like to be uh, continuously just learning and researching. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and I'll say this, if, if I had had mentors when I was doing IT, I probably would still be doing IT. Um, yeah. You know, it's one, of, it's one of those things that uh, I felt like became a very lonely job <laughs> when, when you're only being called for the problems. Uh, yeah. Don't fix this, don't fix that. And, and you don't really have a, a support network around you. 
to, to, to lead you to the next thing and then help your career. Um, and I think that also kind of speaks to, to a little bit of what you, what you alluded to, Carmen, and then that's the diversity in tech, right? Um, yes. And, and the, the, you know, needing to, to add mentorship and career development when you're talking to women in tech, when you're talking to, to, to black in tech or, or Latinx in tech, you know, having mentors around to, to bring up that, that portion of the, the hidden genius that's out there that may not know, you know, what's possible, what's necessary, um, you know, digging down into the high school level and, and bringing some of the, the kids along now that are, that are, you know, tech native, really, um, mm -hmm. but, but don't know what's out there. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, we could go a whole different path with diversity in tech. Yes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, you know, I mean, there's been a, a research, and we have st statistics now that, that support that the diverse mindsets are, you know, are helping us with better solutions. Yeah. We know that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. it's been proven. So now we just need to figure out how we, we attract uh, the diversity, how, and, and you know, Louis, in the last couple of years has been my passion, you know, uh, actually my mission to, uh, to go from just talking, because yeah. there's a lot of talking in the last five, five or more something years, not enough women, not enough diversity, and there's a lot of conferences and conversations, and I just had this, uh, you know, um, I don't know, I, what would you call it? It was just one day I said, okay, I just need to stop talking. I want to do something, right? And that's how this 100 Women in 100 Days career, uh, Cybersecurity Career Accelerator came about, is I wanted to take action. And uh, I kind of wanted to break the myth of saying that women are not interested in cybersecurity. So the moment I actually announced that we were going to be doing the accelerator to bring more women into cybersecurity, I had, in the first hour, I had 60 women register. I mean, it was incredible. And then we had in, you know, a couple of weeks, we had 500 women. So right. if they were not interested, they wouldn't be signing up. You know, it would, uh, it, it's, so, so fast forward. I mean, we've, uh, we were very lucky last year to got, uh, to get uh, funding from Craig Newmark, um, the founder of Craigslist, uh, right. put money into it. We, we trained hundred women upskilled them and a lot of them are already working in cybersecurity jobs this year so super excited about that uh, city of sacramento um, and the the innovation lab, urban innovation lab um, has also granted us uh, funding this year to take another group of women to the training so super excited we've added we we actually we um, redid our program, added a lot of exciting workshops to, to the initial uh, curriculum. So su super excited about that. And back to what we we're saying, diversity, right? I mean, um, there's a lot of reasons why, why we need that better solution. Uh, we are more uh, uh, performance. Companies perform better. Right. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons for, for doing that for sure. So, and lack of skilled cybersecurity talent. We have a serious issue. We have an increase in attacks. We have increased cybercrime, but then we are not skilling up quickly enough, you know, to get the talent into, into the right. Yep. It's, it's so true. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, you know, I think the, the, the lack of talent, you know, is, is kind of two things, that, right? It, it's lack of awareness of what's possible uh, and, and probably a little bit of fear when you hear cybersecurity and and everybody assuming that you have to be you know a, a tech genius to 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 do cybersecurity right um you know cybersecurity is one of those industries right now that boasts uh, a near zero percent unemployment rate just because of of all the cyber security needs that are out there uh, from business to universities city government uh, state government whatever uh and oh thank you very much uh, Perfect. Right there is a slide that actually, you know, kind of depicts uh, what the needs are in just the next 12 months. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity, and I'm going to ask MJ to talk about this a little bit, about training programs that are out there uh, to, to get people um, even, even interested to explore what a, tra what a training program would look like and, and what they can actually do. Yeah, there's there are some tremendous resources out there. I'm thrilled to hear what Carmen's working on. I've I've uh, 
you know, Lewis and I have the good fortune of serving on, on a board together with, uh, with Comtia, the association I mentioned earlier, and, and Comtia for a number of years has had a, a really active um, community that's encouraging women and minorities to, to get into tech and yes. working at a very grassroots level. I mean, we really need to get down to the middle school level and, and start, start there. And it's not just about coding. And, and so many of the school systems, you know, when you think about tech, I mean, I remember when my kids went through, they learned GarageBand in high school. Mm -hmm. I, I was flabbergasted. Um, you know, and, and the whole focus is, was around coding. We, we need to get <clears throat> our teachers, you know, the people who are on the front lines, understanding what career opportunities are out there and how to expose the kids. Um, I remember going to a to a, a tech charter school in the metro Chicago area years ago that was funded through CompTIA's um, foundation, and it, it was it was absolutely focused on kids from at risk neighborhoods who applied, and you know they were look they they the kids recognized that tech was a way to a better future, and right. they 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 just needed access, and they weren't getting it in the public school system. So there's there's massive opportunity and, and fortunately there's a lot going on out there right now. There's a lot of activity happening, but yes. you know, it's not difficult to skill up for this. It's, it's, you know, there, there are numerous resources to do it and you can do it quickly. You can do it over time, but there are some, there are some great success stories that, that have come through um, CompTIA's creating IT futures foundation, for example, with, with mentorship and internship and training programs that you know are are either federally or locally funded and and we just you know we as a community need to continue to push the envelope on that because there are great careers you know when when i hear that you know people say you know we've got to rebuild this piece of our economy or that piece of our economy I mean, here's a piece of our economy that is literally looking for every able-bodied person, does not matter what color your skin is, does not matter what gender you are. If, if this appeals to you and, and you've got the ability to skill up, there is a very well-paying job sitting there waiting for you. Uh, sure. So it, it's, yes. it, it's a green field time from that perspective, you know, that, that there's, there's really some unprecedented opportunity that's out there. You know, you could make the argument that it's born from some, you know, negative influences, but hey, you know, it, that, that's the world we live in. But um, it, it's, it's about as level playing field as we could ever look for. And I know personally, you know, some of the smartest people I know in cybersecurity are not, you know, white middle-aged men like me. And, and that's, that is a good thing. You know, Carmen and, and Lewis, you're both 100% correct. I remember CompTIA did a, did a research study a few years ago and it, it actually showed that, that companies that invested in a more diverse workforce, whether that was racially diverse or gender diverse, were more profitable. Yeah. So, the, yes. you know, right there, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We, we, right. as, we as human beings thrive best when we are intermixed among one another, not when we're closed off in an isolated group. So it only makes sense that that, that translates into the business world. Absolutely. Think about, you know, just bad actors. I mean, they are diverse from everywhere, from every corner, every race, every gender, everything. You, you bet. Know, I mean, they are going from all the angles at us, right? So why can't we defend ourselves with the same power? You know, 100%. Power. Yeah. So, Agreed. yeah, 100%. So we have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, I got, I have two closing questions for you guys. But, but first, I just want you guys' opinion, because I think I heard it. Um, how early should, should people start thinking about cybersecurity? I, I think it should start when you put a, a phone in your kid's hand. So, you know, so, you know, third grade, you know, kids should already be learning about how to protect their infrastructure and, and, and what to do and not to do when it comes to, to cyber conversations. What do you guys think? And that's not one of the last two questions, but I just thought I'd throw that out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely agree with you. And it's funny, I just had a conversation yesterday with a lady that um, it's writing children's book. And she, uh, she, she wrote a book about the, the guidelines for security guidelines for, for little children. 
and with the pictures and everything. So I, it's the, you know, sooner you can do it, the sooner you can do it, the better it is. I mean, yep. bring him up with the, with that, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, with that education in mind, you know, just, just uh, keep him aware, make him aware, educate right. him, give him books, what, whatever way, you know, to, to keep him up to, to the latest threats and, and protect themselves. Yep. Yeah. You know, you, you, I agree. You, you have to start early. I mean, I, I remember as a little kid walking, you know, I, I was, I was able to walk to a, well, it wasn't really a neighborhood elementary school, but it was, it was, you know, you could walk to it. Um, but I remember I knew where the one house was halfway on my walk that had, it wasn't McGruff, but you know, there, there was a sticker in the window yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and we all knew that that family had been trained to help a child who was scared. You could have been walking home and somebody pulled up and talked to you and you freaked out. Wow. You knew right, you could right. run to that house. You know, I, I never awesome. had to, but you know, I knew I was aware, you know, there was risk out there. Right. Um, to, to somebody trying to pick a kid up who's walking on, along the street. Same thing, you know, when, when we gave our, our daughter, one of our daughters, who ironically now is a police officer, that, that there's a funny little corollary here, but when we gave her her first cell phone when she was in elementary school, because we wanted to keep track of her, it was a phone yeah. that had four buttons. The four buttons mm -hmm. called mom, dad, yeah. older sister, 911. That was right. it. And, yeah. and we explained that that was for her security because she wouldn't have to think too much. She would know what to push and it prevented anybody from calling her who wasn't one of right. those four buttons. And that was right. for her safety. And, right. and that resonated. Um, yeah. and, and she's obviously a pretty safety. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I'm not sure it's because of the cell phone, but no, right, know, right, right. I'll, I'll play that any phone. way I yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, to your point, I think you, you, you start as soon as you put an electronic device in their hands mm -hmm. that allows yeah. any type of external communication. Yeah. The, the last two questions I have for you guys, um, any, any parting advice for the viewers right now that you guys have? Let's start with, with Carmen. Well, I think um, be just, um, be, continue, be aware. I mean, that's, that's the, the biggest thing, whether you are, um, you know, whether you own the business, whether you work for a company, uh, whether you are just a consumer, I mean, just, just, to, you know, stay aware, read up on things. Um, there's a lot of guidelines. I mean, I mean, we, we could actually send the viewer some of the, you know, guidelines that have already been put together, if that's something that uh, you want to share, Louis. With yeah, that'd be awesome. Us. Um, but, but it's definitely just read upon the things, be aware when you use your devices, uh, and just, yeah, stay alert, you know, because those things can happen pretty easily with the bad actors out there. They're preying on us constantly. Yeah. MJ? Yeah, I would say, you know, don't be intimidated by the subject matter. It, it, you know, it, it sounds, you know, it can sound scary. It can sound complicated, but you know, don't, don't skip over those news articles that talk about cyber threats and breaches and, and, you know, you'll pick up things here and there and, and look for opportunities to bring in training. Um, mm -hmm. There, there are free resources that are sponsored by very credible organizations out there. There are very inexpensive resources that you can purchase and customize to your business. But, you know, to, to Carmen's point, awareness is, is important. And, and I would say just, you know, don't be intimidated by it. It's something that we all have the capability to help with. And, and that's what it's going to take to stay ahead of the bad actors. Yeah. And so my last question, I'm going to put, I'm going to put some rules around this. You can't <laughs> use, you can't use, don't be intimidated and you can't use be aware. But if you guys were creating <laughs> uh, a bumper sticker about cybersecurity, what would it say? <laughs> This is funny. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we use the same word quite a bit, but uh, okay, so I can put it in different words. Maybe uh, stop being comfortable, think security 24 seven. Okay, yeah. all right, I like that, I like that. I would say um, there's nothing between you and the anarchy, be cyber smart. Nice. <laughs> nice, <laughs> love it. <laughs> All right, and and yeah, so so in closing, you know, we'll make. Uh, I know there's been some requests uh, about getting access to some of those resources. Uh, I shared my email, so if anybody has uh, direct questions about how to access these resources, just hit me up, 
uh, and, and I'll, I'll connect you to whoever uh, you want to be connected to. But right now, I really want to do a, a sincere thanks to MJ and Carmen for taking the time to be with us today and taking part in this, this cybersecurity in the age of COVID webinar. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. This is, this yeah, is thank you so pleasure. much, MJ. MJ. Thank you, Lewis. And have a great rest of the day. Enjoy Absolutely. the conversation. Thank you. Take care, thank everyone. You Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.